Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Helen Berkowitz. I'm a senior marketing manager here at Practitest. Um, before I introduce Matt and we get started, I wanted to take just a couple of moments to let you know a little bit about what's going to happen today, the agenda, um, a little bit more about Practitest to, for those who may be new. So uh, if you'll bear with me for just a moment. And then I will hand things over to Matt. So welcome again. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're joining us from. Uh, today, I'm joined by Matt Heuser, who's going to speak to us about test strategy on ongoing projects, building airplanes while they fly. Matt is a well-known global speaker and contributor to uh, software testing strategies and agile awards. He's well sought after and has a new book precisely on this topic. Matt's going to help guide us in the direction of how to create lasting uh, impact for your companies in terms of your testing strategy. Um, so before we get started, just one second, there we go. Okay. So uh, a little bit about practice tests for those who, who may be unfamiliar. Um, practice test was founded in 2008 as one of the first fully SaaS based test management companies. Uh, at the time, as those of you uh, may remember that uh, most of our competitors were on-prem and that kind of created a number of concerns of privacy and security of data. And so uh, we've made sure to include a number of industry protocols to uh, make sure that our customer data is as private and secure as possible. Uh, over the years, uh, as testing kind of shifted into um, silo processes, we've evolved as well in both supporting manual and automated testing, kind of focusing on testing orchestration. Um, today, our uh, platform includes a number of AI-powered capabilities that really help our customers um, automate many time-consuming manual tasks and kind of just help them take the guesswork out of testing and become more efficient. Um, we've established ourselves as a leader in the test management space. Our customers trust Practitest to help them deliver high-quality software faster. Ours is a user-friendly platform, so we really put a lot of thought and planning into making sure that it's got great navigation, easy to use, uh, easy to use interface, and really helps uh, our customers do what they do best. Um, and as I said earlier, um, we protect our consumer data with industry standards. We're trusted by a number of global leaders across the spectrum of industries, from finance to healthcare from retail to, of course, technology, government publishing, and many others. Um, our customers give us positive feedback really year after year in terms of high ROI, easy administration, world-class support, and quick implementation. So we're really proud of that positive feedback. Um, for those uh, who are new to practice us, we wanted to let you know we've got a live training session on uh, Wednesday, January 24th. So we'd love to have you join us and you can learn more about practice test workflows, AI features, and really adopting a holistic approach to testing. So we'd love to have you join us for that as well. Um, and one final point, um, we've got the, the state of testing survey. It is out now. So for those who may be unfamiliar, every year practice test publishes state of testing report that really gives a snapshot into what is happening on a global scale um, of the, in, within the testing community. So we'd love to have you make your voice heard and join the state of testing survey, share your own insights and experiences and help us create that snapshot of testing. Okay. Oh, no, we're not quite there yet. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give um, things over to Matt now. Um, at any point uh, today, please feel free to raise your hand, use the the uh, Q&A feature um, in this webinar. We'd love to uh, hear what you have to say, ask any questions, and we'll have some pretty cool interactive polls in between as well. So again, um, thank you for joining us today, and I'm going to give the floor over to Matt. Okay, uh, thank you, Helen. So let's see if I can share my screen. Desktop to share, and we're gonna press play, and can you all see that, our goals? Absolutely. Okay, fantastic. So unfortunately, I got two screens now. One is PowerPoint, one is what you see. I can't see what's the questions. And But what we'd like to do, if you ask a question today, we'll have, cover it during Q&A. The best question, and Helen, if you're reading them, if there's something that's really present, let's go ahead and interrupt me. Um, 
the best question, we're going to get you a copy of the book. So how about that? But um, this talk is for people that actually like to test, like are good at it. Okay. So if you, what you want to do is, is get a get a whole list of of like everything written down, so you don't have to worry about it. So you can just see have have someone else run it and give you results because you're worried about it. You just want to get it all documented. Um, so this talk might not satisfy. If you so we're just going to automate all of it, we're going to have a computer run it all every time, and it'll be fine. What is the computer running? What is it doing? How do we figure out if that is good enough? How do we visualize and make explicit the risks and the risk trade-offs that we're cho chosen to make? That's what this talk is about. So I'm a big believer in critical success factors. What are we going to have to do that if we do it, we've succeeded? Doesn't matter what else we cover. And if we don't, we failed. Doesn't matter what else we cover. And that's what I put down for these goals. So I want to take this idea of a test case and slice and dice it a little bit. What are the what are the primitive elements of it? What are the pieces that we actually use to construct this thing we call a test case? And then how can we address those primary elements of testing in ways that you can just go do, right? So if you think about your organization, you go to the boss and you say, I want to try this new thing. Well, if you succeed, you want credit. And if you fail, he approved it. In neither of those scenarios does it actually have any advantage for the boss. So I want things you don't need permission to do, that you can just go do on your lunch hour. The most hardest of them might take a couple of lunch hours strung together, maybe three, four, five lunch hours, that can then visualize the trade-offs and choices that we make so that everyone else can be involved. Put it in a Google document, share it around the whole company. And then when there's a problem, we've, we've, we've got some joint understanding of what we're doing. That's what I want to talk about today. And we're going to try to ask a couple poll questions to customize based on who actually showed up today. And I think that's a very, very ambitious hour, and I'm going to dive into it. I hope that makes sense. If not, if you just if you don't like these goals, you know, you can click click the X and go back to work. I, I don't mind. It's fine. So the first question is a poll. And Helen, these questions should exactly match the poll Helen's going to project. Yes. Give me which, one moment. It will appear on screen momentarily. Yep. Which is if you had to pick one kind of testing to do for a new product, what would it be? I know this is a really weird, obnoxious, hard to deal with question because like, that's not, I would never do that, Matt. That's foolish. You want, you want a, a multi-layered filter to catch the bugs. What are you talking about? But there's a purpose to it. So if you had to pick one, what would it be? So unit tests, there, there it goes, it just popped up, great. It says that I can't po I can't vote. Hosts and panelists can't vote. But so I'm not sure how much time. I'll let Helen decide how much time to give for this question. <laughs> we'll we'll give people a couple more minutes. Um, okay. But in the meantime, you can tell us what you would pick and why. Well, that would bias them, wouldn't it? <laughs> That's yeah, a fair that. point. I have a theory about what their answers are going to be. So, and we'll we'll see if I'm right. But I will tell you about the question. I can I can have to answer on the. So there's a professor named Pat Bailey, uh, Calvin College. We went to grad school together. We got our master's degrees together. And sh when I was working in industry, I think he was too at the time, but it was before he transitioned over to academia. He did a research project toward the tail end of our our degrees. Um, and he asked he asked a couple of questions that we're going to ask today, and he came to some conclusions. So we'll see if he's right, and then we'll talk about it at the end. Specifically around what, 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 okay. RSpec and BDD, well, that's interesting. Okay. Okay, all right. We'll see how that shows up. Thanks for answering. And let's, let's get into it then. So let's talk about test cases. I hear this term thrown around and, and it's not just 
the, the, the human test case management system kind of stuff. We also use it for automation. We use it in a lot of different ways. Um, we are spec the, the, the BDD answer. Somebody, somebody gave that as an answer. Um, um, test cases. What is like, what exactly are we talking about? We go to conferences. We use this term. We don't define it. Everybody means something different. And who, who is the customer of the test case? So a lot of organizations, you'd think the customer is the tester. It's created by someone else to be used by the tester, um, which is kind of strange because it kind of puts them in handcuffs and tells them exactly what to do, who's supposed to create it, who benefits from it. And you'd think, you would think there would be some standard for them because we people count them. So we, we ran, the, the, the tooling runs 500 test cases. I had, I had an executive tell me once, we were in 25,000 tests in this automation that was written by this consultant company in a day. What exactly is that doing? And he, he didn't know. Like, I'm pretty sure that was just one assert within a, 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 a for loop that looped through 25,000 customers or something. I don't, I don't know what that is. But you would think if we're going to count them, we should be able to say the average one takes about five minutes for a human to run or is 42 clicks of the computer. And the and there's here's the idea of the distribution so that when we count them, they have some 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 meaning, but they don't. Um, they're just sort of a, a place to hold some work. And my theory, my belief is that what we do is we take a bunch of concerns and we throw them into a pot, we heat the pot up, we stir it, and we say, here you go. We don't really know what the ingredients are, but the result is a test case. So today I wanna work backwards, reheat it out, throw it in the machine, separate all the elements and examine the elements for ways we could do each piece better. And we've only got an hour, so I'm only gonna look at a couple of the pieces. But um, Hopefully, if this doesn't work for you, you are leaving comments and, and Helene can ask me some questions. But I'm going to drive on. So what what are those elements? What are the fundamental elements of testing, especially the ones we've ignored? So uh, I worked at a company a few years ago and they had a test case management system. And it was what Helen mentioned. It was on-prem, so it was on a Windows box, and it got out of date, so they had to update it. But the new version wouldn't run on that version of the Windows server, so they would have to upgrade the Windows server. And the Windows server wasn't powerful enough that to buy a new box. And uh, the sponsoring executive said, we're just not going to do that. We're just going to let it go away. So you had all of this institutional knowledge of how to do testing that he just said, forget it. We're pretty smart. We can figure out how to test it. And they exported all the test cases to spreadsheets that were like encoded strange words, strange names, st st stuck it on a network drive and just let it expire. I, I was there for about another year. And in that time period, there were maybe three times where someone said, I don't remember how to do very specific thing. I want to add a grocery, I want a select statement to find me a grocery fresh item to add to my cart so I can set it up so that delivery is more than four days from now so that I'll get an error message that that's passed, it's no longer fresh. Or I, I want to set up an account with, um, it's a telecommunication system and I want to set up an account. I want to have, I want to have five different stations that are physical locations. And then each of those will have two or three physical phones. And then I'm going to have two or three cell phones. I'm going to want them all on one account, but I want to be in different states so that we get different taxes to show up when they, when we run the billing software. How do I do that? I don't remember. So there's this idea of how do you do the, con and that's in the test case, hidden in there. So I don't know if you've ever done this, but you go look and you go find the piece that does the thing you actually want. And then you do all your testing. I call those recipes. 
Another thing we want is we want predictability. We want to know when we're done. We want to create some kind of burn down. We want to look at coverage. So it kind of ties back to predictability. Like if we have uh, 100 test cases to run and we can run all the test cases, 25 a day, you could be done in four days. Or um, so then if we've run the only the only the tier one, we've in the first day, we got 25%. That's terrible. Like we, the, the, the way these are defined, as I described earlier, the way they're defined, they're not, we can't really count them and have any value in the existing status quo. We want to look at risk and emergent risk. They're not really a good, um, they, they may be tests, tests may be a good, if you, if you say automated tests or tooling that runs, that may be looking at risk, but it's certainly not risk looking at emergent risk. Every build, every build, the thing we should be concerned about is what's different than the last build. One of the major concerns is what's different, what changed? And what traditional test approaches do is they say, let's look at every build as if it's exactly the same as the previous one. I'm concerned about what's different. Uh, and you have this sort of implicit business rules. So the same customer that I talked about earlier, we did have um, acceptance tests that were codified and um, ran in an integrated fitness, an integrated uh, tooling framework. And when people would say, I don't know what this should do, we could say, let's go look at what the test says. Uh, the test says when you put an input of this, you get an output of that. That's right. That was our specification by example. And I think spec, spec Can I by interrupt you for one second? We have a question. Do you prefer to wait or do you want to answer those in real time? Um, if you think it's, it sounds like a burning question, I can take it now. If it's relevant to this this page, sure. Yeah, I think so. Okay. And the rest we can wait till the end. Um, but uh, Nicholas Shaw has asked a question. Um, he says, Matt, do you have any recommendations on where to start when evaluating an existing system quickly? So things like quality of existing tests at all different levels, test coverage of different pieces, key pieces functionality. And he wrote, uh, you know, he guess the short version is like, what do you do when you're trying to evaluate a new system, but to make that evaluation very quick? Great. I will I'll make sure I cover that in the slide that actually has the image of the um, visualization we use. Okay. So fantastic. And that's the next slide is, okay, Matt, that's all great. But what do I do with the system as it runs today? I want all those things that maybe that maybe we have test cases, maybe we don't. Um, but the developers are telling me, here's a piece of so pieces of code, test it. It needs to go out this afternoon. Like, what do I do? So we're going to talk about three or four key pieces, starting with coverage. Coverage of what? So you've got use cases, features, te test ideas, testing within a feature. Um, I used to do search and rescue. So we had this idea of a grid search. And the way a grid search works is when an airplane crashes, um, as it goes down, the the radar will pick it up. It's called end tapping in the United States. Well, you'll get radar hits, but of course, wind and conditions can can change between where it's falling and where it actually lands. So you have the center location, and then you go out in, in an expanding in rough rough circles in, of expansion. That visualization is here. Um, in this one in particular, so you could test slowly out, move and move and move further and further out to test the entire application, and the little dots are bugs. So what you might do if you had a vision, if you imagine if you had a visualization like this to show where your bugs are in the application to guide your testing and to show your executives what's broken. So you could say, hey, I think we need to spend more time in the upper right hand quadrant. Well, those exist. And I've got three, four, five of them um, in this picture. And these are from real, real, real projects. Um, and the upper right hand one, the, the mind map is the one I want to focus on. Um, there's a, a $5 a month or something. It's a free version. It's called mind, mind Meister is what I used to create this. 
I believe this is a one hour visualization. So in one hour, we went through the whole app, we wrote down a bunch of bugs, and we wrote down the feature map as we understood it. So then, and you could do this on your lunch hour. If you, if you already are working on the app, if you're already an employee, just draw a map of all the features. This map of features will have value to the user, user interface people, to the programmers, to the executives, to the program managers, to the people making the roadmap. All of a sudden, people are going to start talking about your visualization. Now, what you can do with it once you've got it is you can color it red, yellow, or green based on how buggy it is. You can, you can give 100 points and say, this is how we're going to invest our test effort. And you can usually inject like a little number in there and say, this is how we're spending the test energy. This is how we're spending the test effort today. And you can make it a web page or a PDF. And you can put it up on your intranet or you can just share the web page. And you will have executives look at it and say, you know what, I agree. You know, you've got 10% effort on reporting. I think that number should be five. Reporting is pretty stable. Okay, boss. And then there'll be a bug in reporting. Like if you don't test it, if you don't test it well, and uh, you're making a lot of changes, sooner or later, there's going to be a bug in it. The executives will come back. Why didn't you find that bug in reporting? And now you bring up your visualization and you say, because we weren't spending much energy in reporting. You were involved in that. Like you've seen this before, right? You know, I had 10% on it. You made me change it to five, right? It's the strangest thing, but this will create real communication, real transparency, and your executive will start to tell you that you need more time to test. We, I did a similar one. It's in the book. There's a story about it. Um, and that was actually on um, uh, bandwidth team members. And uh, the executives actually converted a requisition from programmer to tester, to subject matter expert tester, because we demonstrated to them that the bottleneck was like, there's just too much work for test. So we could do less testing. And they didn't like that. Or what are you going to do? And they actually said, we're going to flip the ratio and create more, more tester roles. That was, that wasn't even my idea. I wasn't even in the room when they made the decision. It was all based on the visualization. Another thing you can do with this there's test effort we're spending today, but there's also how well are things covered. So what we like to use is red, yellow, green for status and the darkness of the uh, fields you can see in the upper left with the requirements test run. The darkness is the depth of the coverage. So they can look at it and say, oh, we need to add more tooling on this feature because it's very, very, very light green, and I'm not comfortable with that based on how important it is. You save it, you project it, and you share it, and then there'll be shared ownership when problems hit. So you wanna communicate the value of testing, visualize it, make it transparent. I think that answered the question. I hope so. If not, I'm sure you'll tell me. The next thing we want to do, I mentioned earlier, some things are hard and they're like hidden in the test case somewhere. We got to go figure out, figure it out. Um, we can, I call them recipes. For every node here, we can link to a Confluence page or some other wiki page that tells us what the recipe is. And the recipe will be the name of the feature, what the feature does, maybe the customer, like who owns it from a product perspective, who develops it, who tests it, maybe where the code is in version control, um, how to run it, how to test it, and then anything complex on how on setup. So that when you're new to the app, you can you can go to the to the to the visualization to learn the feature. You don't know how to use the feature, you click out, you get the recipe, you get back into it. All of this is designed to help us spend more time testing. And, and less time creating documentation that'll get out of date, not get read. And it's going to be more transparent so our customers can actually access it and understand it and it won't put them to sleep. Because testing is fun, right? Like I, I didn't get into this to, to be, it, it should, 
if we're not having fun, we're not doing it right. Um, next, we have to deal with emergent risks. So I mentioned emergent risks earlier. This, the changes between the builds that are different. The things where we go, oh, we really should look into that. Maybe just once. Maybe, maybe just once. Maybe what if, what if question, right? Maybe it's not worth creating tooling around. Maybe it's not worth creating this big document that we saved. You can do that in a spreadsheet. You can have the project, the feature, what it is described well enough that a competent person could figure it out and test it and a priority. And you can sort them. This is spreadsheet, Google Doc. I think Practice Test has some tools for this. Um, and then you go through the priority list in order of priority. And when you run out of time, you're out of time. And you can take all the ones that you've done testing and copy and paste them, cut them and paste them, put them in a different tab. This is the two dones. And then everything slowly moves up. There's a continuous flow of risks. They just become less important as you manage the ones at the top. And you can publish that list so that your managers can look at it and say, yeah, that's not that important. Or you better change the priority there. Then again, when there's a bug, why didn't you test that? Well, it's in our priority list. And you agreed that these other things were more important. In fact, because of these other things that were more important, we found these bugs over here. The question is, which of these bugs over here should we have not found so we had time to find the one we missed? It's a very mature conversation to have. And usually, if you do your job right, the answer will be all these are more important than that one over there. I guess you manage your time effectively, but we need to give you more time. We need to add more resources because this is unacceptable. Okay. Or we, senior management, need to pay more attention to risks and need to get better at the priorities. Great, right? We're making testing visible. We're making its value clear. We're providing information for decision makers to make better decisions. And there may what may fall out of this is things that are not quite bugs that are feature ideas. Again, enhancing the value of test to provide more information to our decision makers. In the bottom right, we have, we did this on a Kanban board and we actually uh, used dot voting. Everybody got right up your risks that can be managed in 20 minutes or less, put them on the board. And then we used dot voting um, to, everybody got three votes and then move them across the board. It's a five person team. So every one of each one of us took one. That was when I took the picture. It was in person on site. And we radically compressed the regression schedule there while dealing with the actual new and emergent risk. I was very happy with that work. Um, you might argue we got lucky. We didn't need, but, but, um, but we were able to radically compress our risk management, make it visible. And anybody want to say, what did, we only gave you two hours to test everything. What did you do? Well, how, do you, how does that look to you? They could actually, customers could actually understand it. It wasn't trapped in some, some, some other system. So almost done. I've given you two or three real, three real ideas to try. But now it's time for our second question. If you had to pick one that most closely describes your role, what would it be? So can we run the second poll, Helen? There you go. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. That's interesting. So they broke out business analyst and product owner from project or development. It's a little bit different than my multiple choice. We'll have to see if that does. Well, we'll give it a few more seconds. I see a few sure. people still considering their answer. I'm sure. And the world is so much bigger and wider than when I started my career. There's so many other paths now. And hopefully, maybe even some people interested in tests that are not quite any of these 
Maybe we have a graphics designer on the call. I don't know. User experience and usability. I'd put that in BA. Wouldn't you say that everything is kind of related and connected in some way today? Well, the agile movement was supposed to kind of blur the lines between the roles. And I think it's been successful at that. Yeah. Oh, cool. Mostly, mostly software. That's really interesting. Okay. 67% are software testers. Yep. Yep. Well, I would tell you that um, I would, Pat Bailey's research said that um, system test, end-to-end -end test. Testers see the value in the testing they're doing. So they don't see the testing in value in unit test. Um, I, I think the answer actually was pretty close to that, but most instead what they're doing was the the, the use cases and the um, specification by example. I wonder if that's what how they're doing it. So let's do, 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 do. Oh, there we go. Uh, one last idea, that's four ideas for you to try on Monday. Um, is so, th so this illustration, what we tr try to do with our clients at Exelon, we usually end up with something like a dashboard. We can do it with something like widgets, you know, um, that's uh, uh, the best way to go where we can, or iframes, one web page that has all these things. So you've got coverage in the upper left, which is all the features, which you can click and get to the recipes. The heat map or something like it is just like it's coverage, but instead it's the red, yellow, green aspect of the current, where things currently stand. We've got our census of risk and then all of our CI, CD at the bottom. And one piece that's missing from this is bugs. Um, and there's a, a screen a screenshot from Zoho Tracker. Uh, practice test has a bug tracker too. Um, you would use whatever bug tracker you want. But if you get an export of a bug tracker, you get the last hundred bugs. You can look at, what are the things we do that should be finding defects? Right? Unit tests, code review, um, merging, um, like CI, CD, uh, feature testing by us, regression testing, regression test tools, testing in production by our test flight alpha uh, customers, and then found, found by a customer. All the things that should, well, found by a customer is the bad one. All the things that should find a bug earlier. Make our list of all our ways to reduce risk. And try to take all the bugs and put them in a category. Front-end UI bug. Front-end UI bug in uh, strange, un unexpected combination of things of multiple requirements. Or uh, a very rare. Um, we had a problem with one e-commerce vendor where everything was fine in Chrome on the phone. But... It was sticky. It was very, very complex UI. It was sticky in Safari. And it turned out it was an expensive product. It was a luxury product. And the core customer use case, if you trace the dollars, the core customer use case was Safari iPhone. The people that were spending money on the product were Safari iPhone. Um, but we didn't we we those bugs didn't get found till test because the developers were developing on Chrome. So we made this one change. Hey developers, do the work on Safari, and a whole category of bugs went away. So if we get a hundred bugs, we can isolate the bugs down to their sort of root group, not root cause, but like definition. And we've got this list of risks. We can try to line up when should this bug have been found and when was it found? And when you do that exercise, you'll find some forms of risk management are redundant, never add any value. And some defect categories are slipping through. So let's develop a risk management technique to find these things that are slipping through earlier. And let's eliminate this ridiculous, redundant, low value testing. There's two improvements you can do in about two hours by looking by looking at bugs and doing a little thinking. And um, people don't do it. The most of the people I know that do it are for our former customers. So there's Matt's summary. Make a mind map of our features. Make a spider diagram of test ideas. Create that emergent risk spreadsheet. 
create that coverage dashboard, review the last hundred defects categories, and then our list our test approaches. That's there's five ideas that any independently minded tester can probably just do without permission, which can add value, which can create transparency. And that's what I got. I'm going to give you a, a minute to sort of digest what's up, what's up there. I will say we go into a lot of detail in the book, which is on Amazon software test strategies. Um, I hope you'll, I don't know, consider it. We're looking to create a discount code, um, which we can send out by email. But right now it's time for thinking about how I did. I know I went through those very quickly. We only had an hour. But what I promised to do was break those test cases apart, find the different elements, talk about how to address them, and give you ideas to try tomorrow. That's what I did. I wish I could have gone into more depth. What I'd like to do, if it's all right, since we're pretty early on time, I'm going to put the cool ideas back up so you can think about them. And I'm going to let Helen do any Q&A that uh, you want to do. Okay, great. Well, first, thank you again for sharing these amazing ideas. I think you've given uh, our audience a lot to think about, and my, including myself. Uh, we do have an um, one written question, and I have a two, uh, two others that were sent my way. So if I can sure. just dive in. Okay. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Nicholas has asked, what bug or issue are you most proud of finding in your career and why? Wow, man. Good one. <laughs> Well, there's a whole story there, and maybe we have time to tell it. Um, Go for it. Um, I think it's been long enough that I can talk about it. I was working at an insurance company, and high deductible plans came out, which are now everybody's got one, but it was new, and there was a real challenge because the the um, prescription and the medical were supposed to be combined and the software didn't do it. So we had to write custom software to do it. So add two numbers together. What's the big deal? Well, there were two big deals. Uh, they hired a developer to do it who didn't know the programming language. And um, what he wrote actually recalculated um, the deductible from the beginning of the year by looping through all of the um, all of the claims and adding them all up for the deductible year. So on January 1st, it's going to run very fast, but by February, March, April, you'd think it would start to start to, it's going to have to add up all the claims. Every day it would run and recalculate all the claims. And it used a, a technology called change data capture, where when every time a new claim in, came in, a trigger would fire and create a row and this something has changed table. And then he had a bug in his select statement where he was joining a table to itself and it became really, really, the big table became really big. So um, when I reviewed it, I said, as code review, I said, um, this doesn't pass. This can't, this can't, this is unacceptable. This is unprofessional. This is bad engineering. I don't know what you're going to you got to start over. And fair to his, I mean, what my boss said was, you don't understand what code review does. That's not the job. The purpose, like you have reviewed it. So you have to check the box. If you find a bug, mark it. And, um, Eventually, I said something like, I can't even figure out what this code is doing. So it's going to have bugs in it that I can't find because I don't know what it's doing. And I ain't dumb. Right? Um, and I don't brag about my intelligence, but I do say I ain't dumb. I think it's funny. And so uh, the code went out anyway. And then <laughs> so the way it worked is big old database. And the first day, it took a half hour to run. The second day, it took an hour to run. The third day, it took three hours to run. The fourth day, the fourth day of the new business year, um, it timed out and crashed. 
and uh, they asked me to fix it. So, and that's what I did. I ended up rewriting all of the code that was in Perl's. Some of the code in the database stayed. And the, the, the two lines of code that I didn't change had a bug in them. So um, it's a political story. Like I found the problem, but I was young, inexperienced, and I didn't know how to communicate about it and just made everybody feel and look bad. Like that wasn't effective. Like, it wasn't good at building a coalition. It's more of a what not to do story. Um, so eventually it's hilarious. It's like, well, it only matters if they're at their deductible, right? They spent $3,000 for the year. Till they spend $3,000 for the year, it doesn't matter at all. So what if we just write one little select statement that finds everybody that spent more than $3,000 for a year that runs every day. And then some human being goes over and updates the database just for the people that are now over. That took me an hour to write and it took um, 10 minutes a day to implement. And it bought us four months to rewrite the whole thing right. Um, and that was, a, that was I'm, that's the story that comes to mind. I found the bug. But I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't effective at building relationships. And I, I think that's one thing testers are not great at. All these little cool fit flashy tools I showed today are all designed to make our customers go, huh, to understand our job and then to try to get them engaged so that when things go wrong, they go, oh yeah, I saw, you You knew about that, you thought of that, but then, oh yeah, but you've got only so much time to do so many things. Yeah, okay, yeah. It totally changes the conversation. Um, in fact, the, the chapters in the book that I'm most proud of are the ethics and politics chapters. And I think now I have provided the answers to what I should have done, done back then. This is a great question. Thank you. Love that question. Well, a new one just came in from Jeff McBain. Jeff asks you. Hi, Jeff. There... <laughs> How's Lansing? I hope you have less snow than us. Sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. How's Lansing? I hope you have less snow than us. But <laughs> but go ahead, Helen. <laughs> sure. Uh, Jeff wants to know if there are best practices for creating a mind map of features and should nodes be workflow based or each screen within the feature? Okay, so... Um... James Bach has a paper, the heuristic test strategy, um, H-E-U heuristic, um, that does go through several different ways to build a spider diagram. His style is more, um, like, I have to look it up, but it's um, San Francisco Depot is his mnemonic and they're, there are a bunch of different things like timing, configuration, um, features. Um, um, but I just use the user interface as my, I can, if I have one hour to build a mind map, I'm just going to go through the user interface and figure out all the different flows and things that you can do. And the major features, usually the names of screens. I mean, so like if you want to study it like a science, you can you can read James's stuff, which is good. Uh, and that's more oriented toward risks. I find that people uh, people can connect to features because features usually have owners. So you can say, who's responsible for the mortgage calculator feature for our credit union? And there'll be a, a person or a team. So I, I like to break it down by features. I don't have much much more than that, but it's what you run into as you are clicking. Um, and you could use buckets of time if you want. Like if I spend more than 20 minutes on this, it's probably a, a top level thing. If it's, if it's three or four clicks, it's probably a, a next level thing. But yeah, that's a great question. I was going to say the other feature I'm kind of proud of was the security bug when I was at Social Text. So we were an early stage uh, venture capital startup in Silicon Valley. And you could do like a left click and you could do... Um, you could insert a user ID and you could type an email address or whatever. You could do a user lookup based on who was a member of your wiki. Think like Confluence, like all of our members. But you 
but that got translated on the back end into like left bracket ID colon a number. And that number was the, 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 their, their ID in the database. So I made a, a page that was like ID one, ID two, ID three, ID four, ID five, ID six. I get, and it would calculate, and it, I got the email addresses of all the members of our board, all of our senior executives and all of our key investors and anyone who early demoed trialed the tool. So there's a guy named Joey Ito, who's like a not quite billionaire, several hundred millionaires, millions of dollars. I figured out his email address um, based on um, reverse engineering the code. Um, it's a security flaw that was in the software. And um, we fixed that pretty quick. So I, I like that one. That's kind of neat. People shouldn't be able to figure out the, the, the email addresses of all your founders and your board. Okay. Do you have time for another one? Sure. I mean, it's 1047. Yeah, sure. I think so. And we'll do like a final goodbye after okay. that. Okay. Uh, this one is um, uh, about transparency. Um, um, I got an uh, anonymous question. Do you think that there's a difference in uh, enterprise versus SMBs in terms of testing transparency? So I guess I'll add my own little comment here. You talked about tr transparency earlier in your presentation. And I think most of us probably are aware at the enterprise level, you know, the larger the company, the more likely it is that there's less transparency, culturally speaking. There are a lot of like corporate, you know, protocols. Well, silos. It's just government. too much information for anybody. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'd also love to hear your answer to that question. Like, what do you see in terms of a difference of transparency depending on the company size and maybe the complexity? Well, in testing, I think a lot of people just aren't interesting, interested. Like, it's just so boring to them, which I don't understand at all. You know, I wouldn't have chosen a profession I found boring. But, and maybe it's scary. I don't know. Um, and they don't like the idea that there are a few big brains walking around who know how to test everything. So they want us to write everything down. So you get documentation that is comprehensive, but incomprehensible. Those two things are in conflict. Um, so there's no, there's nothing good there. It's all, it's all just a mess. So what I like to see is a little bit of documentation that is light and quick and visible and clear. And I just don't see it anywhere. I don't see, the one thing, if it's a small enough SMB, if it's a small enough business, if it's an IT focused business, it's a software provider with five or six employees, 10, maybe when you get to 30. Um, um, TechSmith still had some of this. When I, like the, with the founder of TechSmith, the guy who wrote Snagit was the CEO. So he understood how the testing was done because he used to do it himself. And um, he, he's gotten away from that and his daughter took over the company. They're probably considered an enterprise now. But there was a time, yeah. So I, I think that when you really get to small companies that are tech-driven, you have your leaders understand it. But in terms of testing, publishing what they're doing, I, as, I don't think we're very good at that. We're just not. And that's like, look at my slides. I, I, I'm a tester. I need to get better at improving the quality of my slides so my work can be more accessible to people that care about that. But I can help you with transparency and we're going to get better at that. If we want to move the industry forward, I think it's something we have to do. So let's all work on it together. Yeah, well said. I think um, everyone understands also that, you know, software itself is growing in complexity. So the more transparent, the more simple and the more clear we can be in documentation, all the kind of supporting measures we've got in place can only benefit. I worked at a Silicon Valley, um, um, what do you call it, unicorn, I guess. They 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 had their market cap was around two point three billion when they went public, very recently, um, and it was even that it was a young company, seven years old, something like that, a young company. They'd grown incredibly quickly, and no single person understood everything anymore. No single person really understood the whole system. So what are you going to do when it comes to testing? You're going to look at like the CI, CD deploy process. Um, and then there's what, hundreds of teams. 
and some do a better job than others. But for the most part, when you look at that process, it's just going to have the, the name of the test case, which is going to be a file. Food, foodbar.py. Uh, test underscore the underscore checkout dot py. Like, great. But it's not one file like that. It's 30, and they all are sub features. We got work to do. Okay. Well, thank you for those insights. Thank you, everyone, for joining today. Um, I think that's pretty much it for uh, Q&A. If anyone has any more questions um, or comments, please feel free to send them our way. You can contact um, either Matt or myself or Practice Test um, and let us know. We'll be happy to pass those questions along. Um, Matt, any final thoughts you'd like to share? Let us know how we did. Appreciate it. You for coming. I hope you had the value that we promised. Um, thanks, Helen. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Well, bye, everyone. One uh, one final note, uh, just, uh, just to remind everyone, uh, we'll be sending out uh, an email in the next uh, day or two with a recording uh, of this webinar so you can revisit um, at any time, and we'll send you some additional information to kind of just uh, help you uh, keep track of all this. Um, like I said, any questions, send them my way, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you so much. Bye.